10 facts about Moses that many people are unaware of. Number 1. Moses asked God to erase his name from the Book of Life. What happened for Moses to make this statement and what can we learn from it? It happened at the same time as the worship of the golden calf. The parable of the golden calf sheds light on human nature and the tendency of individuals to stray from their commitment to God. Ironically, while Moses was on Mount Sinai receiving the Ten Commandments from God, the Israelites were breaking them. The first commandment says, You shall have no other gods before me. The impatient Israelites with Moses on Mount Sinai decided to create a new god to worship. For this, they melted their gold jewelry and built a golden calf with it. The impatience of the people led them to seek Aaron, giving him the responsibility to serve as their spiritual guardian in place of Moses. Aaron obeyed and turned his gold earrings into a carved golden calf, which was specifically prohibited. They then engaged in debauchery, worshipping the idol and participating in immoral behaviors such as eating, drinking and playing. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go down at once, for your people whom you brought up from the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have quickly turned aside from the way in which I commanded them. They have made for themselves a molten calf, worshipped it, sacrificed to it, and said, This is your God, O Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. Exodus chapter 32 verses 7-8 Moses' descent from the mountain with the two tablets of testimony found him with Joshua on the way, arriving at the people as they celebrated their idolatrous and sensual feast. In a burst of righteous anger, he broke the tablets of the law as a witness to what the people had already done. Exodus chapter 32 verses 31-34 Then Moses returned to the Lord and said, Alas, this people have committed a great sin, and they have made a god of gold for themselves. But now, if you will forgive their sin, and if not, please blot me. Out of your book, which you have written. The Lord replied to Moses, The one who has sinned against me, I will blot him out of my book. But go now and lead the people where I told you. Behold, my angel shall go before you. However, when the time comes for me to punish, I will punish them for their sin. Moses did not downplay the gravity of the people's sin, nor did he attempt to diminish it. They were responsible for glorifying a golden deity, despite the enormity of the people's sin. Moses pleaded for forgiveness. It was a plea for God's mercy and grace. Moses implored God to forgive Israel because of his identification and sacrifice with the sinful people. If God refused to forgive, Moses asked to be condemned as a sacrifice for his sinful people. Although God denied Moses' request, we can say that God was anticipating the sacrifice of one greater than Moses, who would give himself for the people, bringing complete and total atonement. Jesus had the same sacrificial heart when he died for our sins. God accepted to forgive the nation, but reserved the right to judge individual sinners. Now go, lead the people to the place I spoke of, and my angel will go before you. Number 2. Moses and the Idol of Nehushtan the biblical books of Kings refer to the image of a serpent coiled around a pole as Nehushtan. The image is described in the Book of Numbers. After being freed from Egypt, the people began to complain to God about the conditions of their lives. In direct response, God scattered fiery serpents among them. Many of the people died, and many more were dying. In response to Moses' prayer, God commanded that a bronze serpent be raised on a pole promising that anyone who looked at the bronze serpent would be healed from the serpent's bite. The Israelites began to worship the fiery serpent that Moses had made of bronze. Sometime between Moses and Hezekiah, the bronze serpent is mentioned in connection with Hezekiah's reforms. But the worship of Nehushtan could have been happening long before Hezekiah. According to 2 Kings chapter 18, verse 4, he removed the high places, smashed the sacred pillars and cut down the Asherah poles. He also crushed the bronze serpent called Nehushtan that Moses had made because up until those days the Israelites had burned incense on it. It was called Nehushtan, a bronze sculpture, even with its miraculous healing properties, could become an object of worship. It was blatant disobedience to God's commandments. The bronze serpent was God's method for deliverance during the incident recorded in Numbers and there is no indication that God intended it to have any additional application. It is interesting to note that the literal translation of the word Nehushtan is bronze piece, 
Hezekiah named it Nehushtan so that people would remember it as just a bronze piece without any inherent power. Even in the situation described in Numbers 21, it was God who brought healing, not Nehushtan. A powerful lesson for all of us to learn from Nehushtan is that even good things and good people have the potential to become idols in our lives. All our worship, praise and thanksgiving should be directed solely to God. Nothing else, regardless of their incredible history, is worthy. Number 3. Why was God going to kill Moses in Exodus? The burning bush. God chose Moses to free the Israelites from Egyptian bondage and lead them to the promised land. Moses is also known as the giver of the law and the mediator of the old covenant. The encounter with God in the burning bush where God invited Moses to be the savior of his people was a key event in Moses' life. The Lord promised Moses that he would free his people from Egypt and lead them to a land of abundance, namely Canaan. Forty years after fleeing to Midian, Moses returned to Egypt by God's command with his wife and children, Zipporah, Gershom and Eliezer. But before Moses could deliver the message, he had to learn obedience for himself. He failed to circumcise his son, Gershom or Eliezer, possibly due to Zipporah's opposition, Exodus chapter 4, verses 24-26. But it happened on the way in the encampment during the night that the Lord met Moses and sought to put him to death. Then Zipporah took a flint, cut off the foreskin of her son, and threw it at Moses' feet, saying, You are indeed a husband of blood to me. So he let him go. At that time, she said, a husband of blood concerning the circumcision. Moses was about to be killed by God due to his misconduct. The nature of Moses' transgression is not revealed in Exodus chapter 4 verses 24-26, but the surrounding circumstances offer significant clues. The sacred rite of circumcision, symbolizing the Almighty's covenant with his chosen people, seemed to have been neglected by Moses. This may have been due to pressure from his adopted Midianite tribe Zipporah, who found circumcision distasteful. She might have convinced him not to circumcise his son, explaining her anger. She believed that by shedding her son's blood, she had saved her husband's life. Moses had disobeyed God's command. However, God is now saying to Moses, I use not everyone, I use those who are holy and righteous. You and I know we are not holy and righteous in ourselves, we are righteous only through Christ. So let's not continue sinning, so that grace may abound. Moses was about to return and represent God, but he had not yet done what a righteous representative of God would do, even with his children. Then God sought to kill Moses. God is very severe in his judgments because he is making it clear that he is not a God to be trifled with. Therefore, as Moses was to be the deliverer, he had to work on areas of his own life that were wholly holy, because God is holy. This level of judgment also applies to the Israelites. God shows us that he will not use unjust people to judge others. Moses was inadequate to serve as a spiritual leader due to his unresolved sin, and the problem had to be remedied before he could adequately perform his task. As soon as Zipporah completed the task, the Lord let him go. In summary, God is planning to kill Moses because he was going to teach God's law to the Israelites, but Moses himself was breaking the law and he was not allowed to enter the promised land. Sometimes the punishment does not seem to fit the crime. At first glance, the fact that Moses struck a rock in the desert out of frustration with the Israelites does not seem like a fair reason for him to be prevented from seeing the promised land. After all, he had witnessed the ten plagues, led Israel out of Egypt and through the Red Sea, delivered the Ten Commandments from Mount Sinai, and won many battles for Israel. The Israelites complained to Moses about the lack of water and tested the Lord, and Moses cried out to the Lord for help. The Lord instructed Moses to strike the rock, and water flowed from it for the people to drink. Essentially, the Israelites approached Moses with a problem. Moses went to God. God gave specific instructions to Moses, and by following them, water began to flow. When Moses becomes frustrated and disobeys God in Numbers 20, the second miracle occurs. The Israelites arrived at the desert of Zin, complained again, and God instructed Moses to speak to the rock so that it would give water. However, Moses, in an act of anger, struck the rock twice instead of speaking to it as the Lord had commanded. God told Moses and Aaron that they would not enter the promised land because they did not believe in him. 
Moses faced opposition from Janes and Jambres, the magicians of Pharaoh. When Moses and Aaron confronted Pharaoh, they performed miracles to validate their message. The Egyptian magicians were able to perform similar miracles, but Aaron's serpent devoured the serpents of the magicians, demonstrating the superiority of God's power. This story highlights the supremacy of divine power over any form of magic or opposition to God's truth. Exodus chapter 7 verses 8 to 13 Now the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, When Pharaoh says to you, Perform a miracle to prove your authority, then say to Aaron, Take your staff and throw it down before Pharaoh, and it will become a snake. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and did exactly as the Lord had commanded. Aaron threw his staff down before Pharaoh and his officials, and it became a snake. Then Pharaoh summoned his wise men, sorcerers and magicians, and the Egyptian magicians did the same things with their secret arts. Each one threw down his staff and they became snakes, but Aaron's staff swallowed up their staff. Yet Pharaoh's heart became hard, and he would not listen to them, as the Lord had said. The magicians of Pharaoh succeeded in performing miracles two more times, matching the signs that Moses and Aaron had shown them. The first plague Moses invoked upon the Egyptians was a plague of blood, and the magicians also managed to turn water into blood, just as Moses had done with the Nile River, Exodus chapter 7 verses 19 to 22, plague of blood. Then the Lord instructed Moses to tell Aaron to stretch out his hand over the waters of Egypt, turning them into blood, causing the death of fish and making the water undrinkable. The Egyptian magicians replicated this using their secret arts, but Pharaoh's heart remained hardened, and he did not listen to Moses and Aaron as the Lord had foretold. This was a great act of foolishness on the part of the magicians. Instead of trying to reverse the curse, they decided to turn more water into blood, adding to the curse on their people. It was a distorted way of thinking, and unfortunately it did nothing to help their people. The second plague that fell upon the Egyptians was a plague of frogs, and the magicians exacerbated the problem by conjuring their frogs instead of finding a solution. This further worsened the situation. However, after this, the authority of the magicians ceased, as they could not reproduce more plagues, and they admitted that they were witnessing the finger of God in Moses' signs. Exodus chapter 8 verse 19, Plague of Frogs. The magicians said to Pharaoh, This is the finger of God. But Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he did not listen to them, as the Lord had said. Satan had given the magicians of Pharaoh the power to duplicate some of the signs that God performed through Moses and Aaron. How did the Egyptian magicians manage to perform these incredible feats? First of all, though not as powerful as God, Satan, who was one of the highest angels of God, can deceive, emulate miracles and even predict the future with a certain degree of accuracy. The strength of God finally triumphed over the plans of the Egyptian sorcerers. They were not successful in summoning lice. God's power is vast enough to easily overcome Satan's strength. The ability to perform miracles through power and the willingness to receive them as authentic will characterize the last days. Just as the power of Jane and James had limits, so too will Satan's authority even in the last days. God remains in control. Hope is triumphant in Jesus. Miracles can be used to demonstrate that something is supernatural, but they cannot be used to prove that something is true. These Egyptian magicians were intelligent and learned men. However, Paul noted that they lacked the wisdom that comes from God. Some of us marvel at any real spiritual power without carefully considering that this real power may have a sinister source rather than a divine one. Even if a new power seems to have the answers we are looking for, we should not be seduced by it because demonic forces can come disguised as angels of light. The only man whom God buried personally was Moses. God chose to withhold such information from us regarding the events leading to Moses' death. Moses ascended to the heights of Mount Nebo while Israel camped in the plains of Moab. From there, he had a clear vision of the entire promised land, extending from Gilead to Dan, Naphtali, Ephraim, Manasseh, Judah, the Mediterranean Sea, and the Negev. Moses stood alone on the mountaintop, having a clear view of Canaan, and he did not die in self-pity or complaint. His death was foreseen long before it occurred, and Moses knew sometime before that he would die without setting foot in Canaan.
The great man had a broad knowledge of his departure. In Deuteronomy chapter 34, verse 6, Moses' burial place is mentioned. God buried him in the valley in the land of Moab opposite Beth Peor, but no one knows where his burial place is until today. Number 7. The location of his body is unknown. The Lord then concealed the tomb. What led him to do this? Because that tomb would have become a sanctuary. People would still be tracing a path to Nebo today, building shrines, selling popcorn and peanuts and offering various tours, possibly even sending a tram there with huge banners declaring Moses' burial place. So it was concealed. This was so crucial to the Lord that it even provoked an angelic confrontation. Number 8. The Devil Fought for Moses' Body Jude verse 9 refers to an event not found anywhere else in the Bible. Moses had to fight or contend with Satan over Moses' body, but what that entailed is not described. In Jude 9, however, Michael, the archangel, when contending with the devil and discussing Moses' body, did not dare utter an injurious accusation against him. But he, he, he said, the Lord rebuke you. This event occurs in Judea. Here, Jude shares with us an incident not found anywhere else in the Bible. Naturally, the question arises, where did he get this information? Some say the information was passed down by tradition. This may be true or not, we have no definitive knowledge of how the dispute between Michael and Satan over Moses' body arose. It's not unlikely that Satan would want to know the location to build a sanctuary there. Michael refused to make a presumptuous judgment and simply announced the rebuke of the Lord. Despite his great power, Michael remains completely submissive to the Lord. Righteous angels have a hierarchy and are submissive to authority. Considering Michael's strength, the archangel's submission to God is even more beautiful. We can see that submission is never meant to take away strength, purpose, or value from an individual. The strength of Archangel Michael was not in question as the last mention of Michael the archangel appears in Revelation chapter 12 verse 7 when Satan is cast out of heaven. The confrontation is a necessary evil. No one enjoys it, but it must be done to correct, purify, and unify the community. Number 9. Moses Meets Jesus The transfiguration of Jesus is mentioned in each of the Gospel books as an important event in Jesus' life and proof of his divinity. Jesus takes only three of his followers, Peter, James and John, to a high mountain after performing a series of miracles and predicting his death. This is the scene of the transfiguration where his appearance becomes radiant. Matthew chapter 17 verse 2, And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. This glory conveys real presence, for in his person the kingdom of God is with his people. The inner circle of disciples witnesses a profound revelation of Jesus' identity and his mission. During this transfiguration, two of the most important figures from the Old Testament, Moses and Elijah, appear. Their entrance symbolizes the law and the prophets testifying to Jesus the Messiah who fulfilled the Old Testament. Jews see Moses as one of their greatest leaders, but Jesus is even greater. Moses is the one whom God used to give the law, and Elijah is the one who connects the charismatic prophecy from the days of Samuel with the later prophets who wrote. Moses is also considered the model prophet, and Elijah is the forerunner of the Messiah. Malachi chapter 4 verses 4-6 mentions both the delivery of the law through God's servant Moses and the sending of the prophet Elijah before the imminent day of the Lord. Their presence on the mountain with Jesus demonstrates Jesus' majesty as the only one who will be called the Son of God, transcending them both. Into the cloud of God's presence appeared to Moses on Mount Sinai, its brilliant Shekinah filled the tabernacle, the cloud of God's presence led the Israelites into the desert, and the glory cloud of the Lord filled Solomon's temple. Jesus fulfilled both the law and the prophets, as evidenced by his superiority over Moses and Elijah, whose revelations ultimately point to Jesus because Jesus is the incarnate Son of God, the ultimate prophet who fulfills Moses' prophecy. Disciples must listen to him to understand his messianic mission. When the disciples look up, they see only Jesus. Their attention is now solely on Jesus, as Moses and Elijah would have preferred because their ultimate significance was in preparing the way for the Messiah, the 3623 Son of God, and his redemptive purpose. Number 10. Moses Sees God Moses asked for God's presence to guide his people to Canaan, Exodus chapter 33 verses 12-17. 
Moses said to the Lord, Look, you tell me to lead this people, but you haven't let me know who you will send with me. Yet you've said, I know you by name, and you have also found grace in my eyes. Now, if I have found grace in your eyes, please teach me your ways so that I may know you and find grace in your eyes. Consider also that this nation is your people. And the Lord said to 3705 Moses, I will also do this thing that you have spoken, for you have found grace in my eyes and I know you by name. Here we see Moses and God conversing openly and honestly, as if they were friends. God had promised to send an angel to accompany the Israelites, but this did not satisfy Moses. Who exactly was this angel Moses was interested in? Moses desired God's presence to accompany the Israelites, not just an angel. Moses also asked God to teach him his ways, which God granted. In Exodus chapter 34, verses 38, 22, 5, 7, the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. Moses encountered God in a burning bush, witnessed how God humbled Pharaoh and the Egyptians, saw God part the Red Sea, provided water from a rock, and spent 40 days and 40 nights on Mount Sinai with God. Moses had witnessed the signs and wonders of God and now desired to personally encounter God. This desire was more desirable than all of God's works and blessings combined. To personally know God is the greatest blessing any human being can receive, John 17:3. God graciously responded to Moses' desire to know who would go with him, saying, My presence will go with you, Exodus 33:14. Moses, however, was not satisfied with this relationship. He wanted more of God. Although he had witnessed the burning bush, the parting of the Red Sea, water from a rock, and manna from heaven, all of this was old news to him. He wanted to learn more about God. He desired a deeper knowledge of God. So Moses said to the Lord, Please teach me your ways that I may know you. Exodus 33, 13. Moses was like a hungry man sitting at a good meal. He was not satisfied with just nibbling on an appetizer and tasting the soup. He wanted to devour everything the Lord had to offer. Moses understood what the psalmist said, As a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. Psalm 42, 1, 2. Every believer's heart should have this attitude. God is not interested in mere churchgoers. He desires to be known by those who hunger and thirst for him. Knowing God is the essence of eternal life, John 17, 3. Moses undoubtedly set a wonderful example of intercession and mediation with God. A great man of God, God approved of him. However, a greater mediator than Moses was to come, Jesus Christ, with whom God was also pleased. Because of Christ, Christians also have the same privileges as Moses. We too can know God, we too are friends of God and can speak with him face to face. Then Moses said, Now show me your glory, Exodus 33:18. Moses wanted even more. He said to the Lord, Please let me see your glory. In other words, Moses wanted to see a visible manifestation of the invisible God become public to him and provide a display of his glorious divinity. Are you content to hear a sermon and sing some songs to God or do you constantly long to see more of God in your life, to grasp a greater sense of His glorious glory? Moses dared to make one last special request. Now show me your glory. Exodus 33:18. Above all, it was God's mercy and compassion that led him to renew his covenant with Israel. God then explained how he would demonstrate his glorious goodness to Moses without killing him. He described his appearance to Moses using the terms hand, back, and face, 1 Timothy 6, 15, 16. God in his time would bring about the manifestation described in 1 Timothy 6, 15, 16, which God will bring about in his own time, God, the blessed and only ruler, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone is immortal and who lives in unapproachable light, whom no one has seen or can see, to him be honor and might forever. Amen. God's promise to show Moses his goodness, his glory, was fulfilled shortly afterwards as described in Exodus. 
chapter 34 verses 5 7 and exodus chapter 33 verses 19 20 the lord said i will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name the lord and i will be gracious to whom i will be gracious and will show mercy on whom i will show mercy but he said you cannot see my face for man shall not see me and live Moses's request was graciously granted by the Lord. He promised to show Moses a glimpse of his glory. God would demonstrate his goodness to Moses while proclaiming his name the Lord. Although granted this extraordinary encounter, Moses would be unable to see the face of God, as humans cannot see his face and live. Exodus 33, 21, 23. The Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock, and while my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. Exodus 33, 21, 23. While Moses stood on a rock, the glory of God would pass by, and God would place him in a cleft of the rock, covering him with his hand until he passed by. Afterwards, God would take away his hand and Moses would see his back, but his face would not be seen. In other words, the Lord limited Moses' exposure to his glory for his well-being. He could not endure more than a glimpse of God's glory from behind. Nevertheless, his face would shine with the wonder of the encounter and the joy of speaking with the Lord. As a result, even from this limited exposure, Moses' face would shine with the glory of the encounter and the joy of speaking with the Lord. Although God is spirit and has no body, and therefore no back, just as he has no arms, no one has ever seen God in all his glory. However, the Son of God revealed him. Indeed, Jesus told his disciples, Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. John 14, 9. Thus, we continue to walk by faith with God. We have reached the end of our video, and I hope you like it. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a comment on the video. Continue watching videos about the history of the Bible. I will leave Teku recommendations here on the screen. God bless you. We will get to the next video.